Hello. In this video, I want to give um, an introduction to the center of mass of a system as a concept and uh, its definition and the special properties that the center of mass has. We're going to use this as a way to launch into our unit on rotational mechanics and how this is connected to that will become apparent over the next days and weeks. But this is an introduction to center of mass. So, okay, so I've got a system here. Um, just a two-dimensional world here. So I've got an x-axis and a y-axis, and we're looking at positions of various masses in this space. So I've got five masses, M1 through M5, and I've got um, uh, five position vectors for each of the masses. So that's R1, R2, R3, R4, and R5. Um, this is a system of a bunch of discrete masses, and we define a center of mass for this system as the position that represents the weighted average of all the mass in the system. So let me write that down. The center of mass is a weighted average. It's the position which is the weighted average of all the mass in the system. Okay, um, so it's really just a weighted average. And so we can write down um, what a weighted average would mean in this context. So we call this R sub CM, and that's gonna be the sum of all the masses in the system times their position vector. So summed over everything in the system. So in this case, um, we'd be summing over one, two, three, four, five, but in general, it could be any number. And then divided by the total mass of the system. And M here, I could write that also as a sum where it's the sum of all the, the masses. So I'm summing over I here. So in this case, that would be M1 plus M2 plus M3 plus M4 plus M5. Okay, so this is weighting each position by the mass at that position, and then dividing out by the total mass um, to get back units of, of position. So in this case, um, you know, the, where the position of the center of mass for this system would depend on the values of the masses, of course. Let's just say it's somewhere over here. So that spot would be the center of mass. And we could draw a vector to represent the center of mass as RCM, something like that. Um, though, of course, that position will depend on the specific values of, of the masses. OK, so the center of mass has some special properties that are kind of interesting. Um, OK, so a little bit of math to do here. If I rearrange the center of mass equation. I can say the total mass of the system times RCM is equal to the sum of these MIs times RI, uh, MIs times RIs. Um, nothing super interesting about that. If I take a time derivative of everything here, though, so I take a time derivative. And I end up with something that looks like this. So the total mass of the system is a constant that's not changing. The only thing I take a derivative of on this side is RCM. Um, we'll call that VCM. So the, the time rate of change of the position of the center of mass, we'll call that the velocity of the center of mass. So how, uh, you know, how fast and which direction is the center of mass moving? So that's something. On the other side, we can take the time derivative of each term. So that would be MI times VI. So that would just be the masses of each individual particle times the velocity of each individual particle. This is just the sum of all the momenta in the system. So this is the sum. I guess I should put my index on there too. So this is the sum of all the momentum in the system. So this is just the total momentum of the system. So I'll, I'll put that piece of tote for total momentum. Um, that's kind of interesting. So what this says is if we take the total momentum of the system, 
that's equal to the total mass of the system times this VCM. Um, and one other thing to uh, note here is if I take another time derivative, so if I take one more time derivative here, then I'm getting m times the time derivative of VCM, which would be ACM, let's call it, is equal to dp dt, where this is the total momentum. But if we take the time derivative of the total momentum, that's equal to the net force on the whole system. So this is equal to the net force on everything in the system. Um, and we could also write this just as all of the external forces on the system, because we know the internal forces are going to cancel out. All the forces that exist between the individual masses in the system will cancel out when we take the net force over the whole system. And so we're left with just the sum of all the external forces acting on the system. What this means is we get this interesting equation that is Newton's second law. Um, but says that there, the center of mass behaves like a particle with the total mass of the system um, that moves according to the external forces acting on the system. Um, let me write that down because that's really important. The center of mass behaves as a particle or as a point mass with um, mass m, or I guess I should say of mass m, of mass m, total mass of the system, uh, which moves according to um, the external forces acting on the system. Or if you prefer the net force acting on the system. Um, that's interesting. This is why you often hear people talk about the center of mass of the system as, as something that you can track or hold on to, even if the, the system isn't a, a point particle. Because if you take an, the entire system, in a lot of cases, for a lot of applications, you can boil it down to just the center of mass and what the center of mass is doing, which is really interesting. A couple of things to note here. Um, if the if there is no external force on the system, so if there's only internal forces acting between the masses in your system, then the center of mass has a constant velocity. So no matter what's happening with individual particles in the system, the individual masses in the system, if there's no external forces, then the center of mass will maintain its velocity um, and the total momentum of the system will be constant, which we already knew. Uh, we'd already derived conservation of momentum for the system in the case that there's no external forces. This just uh, adds to that a little bit and says that when the total momentum of the system is constant, you have um, the center of mass moving with constant velocity. Okay, I want to give an example of this. Um, so imagine I have, um, so here's my example. So a two-body gravitational system. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to demo this in the, in the gravity simulator that we've used. And as a reminder, in that um, simulation, g is equal to 1. So I'll be, I'll be working there with, in that system. So let's say I've, I put a, a star of mass star equals 1,000 here at 0, 0 um, with no velocity. And over here at 250, 0, I put a planet with mass 100, 1,000 and 100. And it has some velocity. So its velocity is. 2j hat, and our coordinate system is like x, y, something like that. OK, so I can calculate the position of the center of mass here by um, calculating RCM, 
is equal to one over the total mass of the system times the sum of mi ri for everything in the system. Okay, so let's actually plug this in and see what we get. So one over the total mass is 1,000 plus 100, that's 1,100, times the sum. So we have 1,000 mass at zero. So that's just 1,000 times zero, plus 100, that's the second mass, times 250 i hat. These are vector quantities. So RCM is equal to 1 over 1,100 times 100 times 250 i hat. So 250 over 11. And that's something like 22.72 repeating i hat. So our center of mass is somewhere, maybe just to draw it roughly there. So that's our center of mass position um, at about 22 in the x coordinate and zero in the y coordinate. It makes sense that the, that the y coordinate would be zero um, because both of our masses are at zero. So the center of mass better be right in between them because it's the weighted average of all the mass. Um, there's another thing we could find out too, which is um, how fast is the center of mass moving? So at this moment in time, the total momentum of the system, um, so the total momentum of the system is equal to um, the mass of the star times zero, because there's no velocity at this moment in time, plus 100 times two j hat. The total momentum therefore is just 200 j hat. And this is the uh, momentum of the center of mass too. So we can write this like it's the total mass of the system times the velocity of the center of mass as though the center of mass um, carried all the mass in the system and was moving at the center of mass velocity. So the VCM then would just be 200 over 1100 J hat. Um, that's VCM. So that's how fast the center of mass is moving. Another thing to note here is be, there's no external forces in the system. Um, if we only consider these two masses acting on each other and nothing else in the system, the total momentum of the system will be conserved and therefore the center of mass velocity will be constant as well. Um, so I wanna show you what this looks like um, in the actual simulation. So give me a second to load that up. Okay, so here's the simulation. I've got it loaded such that I've got a star of mass 1000 here at zero, zero. I've got a planet uh, mass 100 here at 250 zero and it's going up with speed two as in the, the uh, picture I, I had drawn before. So let's watch it and see what happens. So if we let the system go and see what happens. So we've got the planet starting to orbit around the star, but the star is moving too. And you'll notice that as we watch this system evolve in time, it seems as though there's a spot about which the star and the planet are both orbiting. Um, that's always directly in between the planet and the star. That's the center of mass. So somewhere on the line between the planet and the star will be the center of mass. And if you watch that spot over time, it just moves up. Um, and I want to let this system cycle for a second so you can see what it looks like before I try to represent the center of mass on here and show you um, how to visualize it. So you can see that the cycle kind of repeats, except everything's shifted up um, because the whole system is moving up. There's some total momentum in the Y hat or in the J hat direction. So some total momentum straight up. And as the system evolves over time, it repeats um, while translating up. And we'll see this cycle repeat again and again. It makes this beautiful kind of pattern, this really interesting pattern. Um, and we could try to figure out what sort of curves these were. You might be able to guess. Uh, they kind of look like cycloids, huh? Um, 
But let me let me reset this simulation. So let me send the star back to zero zero. Zero zero. And let me give it zero speed again, zero heading. And let's put our planet back to 250. Zero. Heading 90, speed two. Okay, I'm gonna turn the traces off, turn back on. And now there's one more thing I'm gonna add here. So I'm gonna add another planet and I'm gonna put that right at the center of mass, except I'm gonna make it so that it doesn't gravitationally interact with anything. So I'm gonna put that here and I'm gonna give it zero mass so it doesn't screw anything up. And I'm gonna give it the center of mass's speed, which was uh, 211, so that's 0 0.181818, 0 0.181818, heading 90. And I'm gonna put it at the center of mass and the center of mass was 250 over 11, which is 22.72. And we're gonna watch what this looks like as it goes. Um, so let's let this thing go and see what happens. So now that, that middle star represents the center of mass. And you can really see that it exists on a line between the planet and the star. And the planet and the star are kind of orbiting about that, that point. Um, and in fact, that center of mass will be the focus of an ellipse. Um, if we change our reference frame, that center of mass will be the focus of an ellipse um, that the planet's moving on and the focus of an ellipse that the star is moving on. That center of mass moves in a straight line vertically and the star and the planet orbit around it, uh, which is really cool. Um, and I'd encourage you to pull this up and take a look at it for yourself. I'll let it cycle one more time so you can see it again. Maybe not the whole way. There's one final thing here that I'd like to do is um, knowing that the center of mass moves with constant velocity, we're always free to take a look at this system in a different reference frame. And a convenient reference frame that we could look at would be the reference frame of the center of mass. If we change our reference frame to be the reference frame of the center of mass, that is the reference frame in which the center of mass appears not to be moving, then the total momentum of the system will be zero. And we'll see uh, closed orbits here. So let me, um, I think there's a button I can press over here. All right, let's try this one here. Okay, so that centering button over there um, changes the reference frame to be the center of mass frame. So now we've got our center of mass star just sitting there, zero velocity. The total momentum of the system will be zero and we're gonna get closed orbits about that center of mass. Um, so anytime you have a system where the net force is zero or the external forces are zero, you can always translate to a reference frame where um, the center of mass is not moving and will never move. And you can see now that we are getting ellipses. They're close to circles, but not quite. Um, and the center of mass will be the focus of the ellipses, one focus of the ellipses that these orbits are on. Um, so I thought that was cool to look at. And we'll look at some other examples of center of mass and how we can use it uh, coming up. Uh, but I hope that was helpful for an introduction and for some of the utility of the center of mass as a concept. And I'll see you soon. Okay, bye.